Now, Mises says there's no irrational action, but clearly he's wrong. Because look at all of you. Uh, you had the choice of going either to a talk on anarchy or to a talk on methodology that's a rehash of a paper you already had in your, uh, in your packet. And yet here you are. Uh, well, I guess I won't complain. Um, uh, by the way, the, um, uh, the one in your packet is, a, uh, is an early draft. So if you look on the uh, online of the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, the, the final version is uh, the even newer, spiffier version. Okay, so those of you who heard Roger Garrison's uh, talk earlier have heard some of the differences uh, between Mises and Friedman when it comes to sort of macroeconomic analysis. Uh, I'm stepping back to sort of one step further uh, to talk about some very basic disagreements about um, uh, about methodology, economic methodology, social science methodology in general. Uh, there are two uh, particular famous criticisms that Milton Friedman makes of uh, Austrian approaches. And I think that these two criticisms are interesting related. That is to say, I think that they both are, stem from the same philosophical mistake, which I'm going to say is a mistake of confusing logical with psychological categories. What I mean by that will hopefully become clearer a bit later on. So let me talk about the first one. Uh, famous criticism from Milton Friedman about the Austrian a priori method. Uh, he's given, there are a number of versions of this quote because he's said it a number of times. Uh, he's said it and he's written it. The, one I have, the quote I have here on the handout is uh, from uh, an oral rather than a written presentation, which is... Uh, which explains a little bit sort of the informality of the wording. But he's also said this in print as well. I just, this is the one I found. Uh, he says, if you and I are both praxeologists, and we disagree about whether some proposition or statement is correct, how do we resolve that disagreement? We can yell, we can argue, we can try to find a logical flaw in one another's thing, but in the end we have no way to resolve it except by fighting, by saying you're wrong and I'm right. On the other hand, if you take more like a Karl Popperian approach, you know, the idea of Karl Popper, that scientific things are things that are, uh, scientific statements are statements that are empirically falsifiable. So you go around looking for evidence to, what would count as evidence against it. I say to you, what facts can I find that will convince you that I was right and you were wrong? Then we go out and observe the facts. That's how science progresses. So here's Friedman's picture. If you have an empirical dispute, we have a way of resolving it, because empirical disputes are resolved by evidence. So we go out and look, you know, look for evidence. Uh, I've been making an empirical claim, like um, uh, cranberry juice makes your head explode. Then we go out and feed some people cranberry juice, see if their heads explode, and no? Okay, well, then, you know, I'm back to the drawing board. We've tried another bold conjecture. Um, whereas if we have a, uh, an a priori dispute, a dispute that's purely conceptual, that we addressed purely by thinking about it, there's no, um, you know, there's no empirical uh, question that will, uh, no empirical observation that will resolve it. Then Friedman thinks that ultimately we're left simply with a clash of intuitions. Something seems self-evident to me, something else seems self-evident to you. There's no way we can argue. We just have to, uh, you know, duke it out. Uh, nevertheless, in passing, he does suggest and dismisses it rather quickly without explanation, the possibility of, as he finds it, trying to find a logical flaw in one another's thing. Um, well, that seems like a wor worthwhile possibility, right? I mean, what happens if, if two mathematicians get into a disagreement? Uh, well, there's no way you can empirically resolve uh, a lot of mathematical disputes. Does that mean all they can do is fight and make frowny faces at each other? Um, well, not necessarily. You know, they could go through the reasoning and the calculation and try to see where the other person has made an error. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, you know, in a way it seems so obvious that Friedman actually, you know, mentions it in passing, trying to find a logical flaw in the other person's position or the other person's argument. Uh, so why is he so quick to dismiss it? Well, I think that he's thinking of it this way. I think he's thinking of of a priori reasoning is something like consulting some private psychological episode in your head. 
So I've got some private sort of, you know, in my little movie screen inside my head, you know, there's some show playing, and in your head, inside your head, there's some different show playing. I can't see inside your head, and you can't see inside mine, so I keep staring at this, you know, this glowing self-evident thing in my head, and you're staring at some glowing self-evident thing inside your private little mental theater, and neither of us can see the other ones, and so, you know, there's no way of resolving a dispute, whereas Friedman's thinking a public dispute, we can both look at the same thing. You know, if our dispute is not about what's playing in our private theater, but what's playing up there, not much, actually, but um, maybe it's a performance of Blue Velvet. But if we, both, if we all look at the same thing, it's a public object. We can all publicly share it. But uh, you know, something is you know, self-evident, that just means it's something that you have this, it's like hearing an inner voice that no one else can hear. You have this feeling of self-evidence about it. But uh, that's not really the right way to think about our prior reasoning. That's not the right way to think about self-evidence. To say that something isn't, to say that something is self-evident doesn't mean that if you think about it, you get a glowing feeling of certainty about it. After all, you could take a pill that would cause you to feel glowing feelings of certainty about all kinds of things. Uh, to say that something is self-evident does not take the psychological claim that, you know, you will be led to adopt it if you think about it. Rather, it's to make a claim about, you know, what kind of statement it is. A self-evident statement is a statement that doesn't need any evidence beyond itself. The evidence for it is somehow contained in the very thought of it. And there's also something odd about thinking of logical or praxeological or mathematical, any kind of sort of you know, a priori conceptual disputes, thinking of them as private. Now, if I have a certain kind of, you know, suppose that after each strawberries I feel a certain kind of odd little tingle and I have a hard time describing to you what it's like, um, and you can't really verify it, you, you taste strawberries and you don't report anything like that, although maybe you're, you have something like what I'm feeling, but you don't, don't call, you're not inclined to call it what I'm inclined to call it. You know, if you think of that as subjective private mental episodes, but that's not what logic is like, that's not what mathematics is like, that's not what praxeology is like. Those things are public. I think about math, it's not as though you know, when, we, uh, when I do math, when I'm thinking 2 plus 2 equals 4, I've got my own private little 2 plus 2 and my own private 4. And I'm thinking that. And when you think it, you've got your own private little 2 plus 2 equals 4. No, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is, is public. It's not, you know, it's not physically observable. It's not perceptible by the senses. But it's public, and the sense it's publicly available. When I think that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I'm thinking the same thing you are. Our thoughts are about the same thing. I'm not thinking about my own private little four and you thinking about yours. Uh, and there are public standards of logic, public standards of mathematics, and likewise then public standards of praxeology. Uh, there's a distinction that the, um, uh, the uh, German logician Gottlob Frege makes. Um, uh, he distinguished between what he calls the inner realm, the outer realm, and the third realm. Uh, for those of you who know anything about Karl Popper, this sounds like a distinction Karl Popper makes. It's actually a different distinction. The differences don't matter for present. It's just sort of, you know, if, if this reminds you of something in Popper, I'm just telling you it's something different. You can ask me later why. If it doesn't remind you of anything in Popper, then never mind. Uh, okay, so the, um, the outer realm are things that are public and... Uh, perceptible by the senses. So this lectern is an outer realm item. It's, you know, it's a material object. It's perceptible by all of us. It's publicly accessible by all of us. I can see the lectern. You see the very same lectern that I do. An inner realm item is an item that's private and not accessible to the senses. So what I'm thinking right now, I mean, you know what I'm saying, but what I'm really thinking, what I'm really thinking about all of you, you don't know. It's, in, it's private to me. I'm aware of it. You can't, you can't see it. You can't see my thoughts. Um, and I don't see them either. I mean, I think my thoughts, I know what they are, but I don't know them my sense perception. Uh, at least that's what Frege thought. I think there are complications about whether that's right, but never mind. Because uh, what I'm really interested in is, is Frege's third realm. There's a third option. There are things that are public, but not perceptible by the senses. And logic and, and, con and conceptual analysis generally belongs to that third category. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that Friedman has confused the inner realm 
and the third realm. He's, thought, he's thinking of logical and conceptual uh, questions as if they were consulting private psychological items. Um, but, you know, now it's true that what the inner realm and the third realm have in common, that is what the psychological and logical realms have in common, is they're both not accessible by the senses. But nevertheless, the logical realm is common and public in a way that, uh, that the, the private mental psychological realm uh, is not. And, uh, you know, Friedman sort of, you know, he's on the verge of recognizing this when he talks about trying to find a logical flaw in the other person's position, which is suggesting that there are common logical standards we can appeal to. But I think he's so much in the grip of this idea of thinking of self-evidence as a matter of listening to an inner voice inside your head or seeing some beatific vision inside your head that no one else can share, that he sort of loses his grip on that insight, you know, that he almost had. Okay, so much, at least for now, about that aspect of Friedman's disagreement with a priorism. I'm going to spend more time talking about uh, something else, but at the end I'm going to suggest that this something else, this other thing I take to be a mistake that Friedman makes, is going to hook back up with that one. Okay, so uh, there's an article by Friedman called The Methodology of Positive Economics, uh, which appeared in a book of essays that's called Essays in Positive Economics, uh, about which Hayek interestingly said that he thought this book was as dangerous in its way as Keynes's general theory. Um, he also said that he regretted not having attacked it more, just as he also said he regretted not having uh, attacked Keynes's book more. Um, part of the reason he didn't you know, attack Friedman's book is that they were sort of political allies in many ways. Um, Part of the reason he didn't attack Keynes is in part because they were allies too on a narrow issue of they were both fighting, fighting inflation. Also, Hayek said, well, Keynes kept changing his mind. It wasn't worthwhile trying to attack his book because he'd probably write another book later and see something different. But anyway, the two books that, the two most dangerous economic books of the 20th century, according to Hayek, and the two books he regretted not having attacked more are, you know, that book by Keynes and this book by Friedman. Uh, and the most famous article in this book is the, you know, is the one on methodology of positive economics. Uh, in this one, the Friedman's criticism does not, as far as I recall, explicitly address the Austrians. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't explicitly name people like Mises and Hayek as his uh, targets. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that you know, they are among the kind of people he's responding to. So there's a criticism that Austrians make of a lot of mainstream neoclassical economics it has to do with the unrealism of the assumptions. Things like perfect competition, where you have to assume uh, in, you know, an infinite number of market participants, you assume perfect information uh, on their part, you assume that, that, that nothing, you know, nothing takes time, that if I change my price, instantly the recognition that the price has changed is immediately propagated through the entire economy and everyone's aware of it. And, you, know, you assume all these things in various kinds of, of models. And um, uh, you know, they're not, it's not realistic. Uh, and you know, from an Austrian perspective, these, things, these models tend to obscure and leave out the very features that actually explain how the economy works. Uh, you know, for example, if, you, if you, are, you have a model that specifies that there are no differences in information and that everyone has perfect information and that information about prices propagates instantaneously through the economy, then... Uh, you know, then lots of things that Austrians want to talk about in terms of explaining why things happen just, you know, just vanish because a lot of Austrian explanations have to do with imperfect information or mistaken interpretation of signals or price signals being distorted by government intervention or uh, changes in prices propagating only slowly through the economy so some people uh, benefit from the new money before they face the new prices and other people face the new prices before they get the new money and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the, uh, the dark forces of time and ignorance, uh, to use a, a popular phrase, are you know, time and ignorance are things that matter to, to Austrians and a lot of neoclassical models just tend to you know, abstract away from them. And so you know, people criticize this. Uh, Austrians criticize it, other people have criticized it too. Friedman uh, wants to defend the use of unrealistic models. And I won't read you the whole passage here. That's the second passage on the handout. But here's basically his idea. He says, look, your criticism 
of, of economic models for being unrealistic doesn't make sense. Because what would a perfectly realistic model have to be? You know, I mean, your complaint is that your complaint is that these models abstract away from various interesting features of the situation. Well, any model is going to have to abstract away from the situation. If you want a completely detailed model of, you know, let's say you're analyzing the grain market, and you really want a completely realistic account of the grain market, then you can't leave any information out. You know, you can't just, you know, have you know, farmers, but you have to talk about what kind of farmers they are, what color their overalls are, and how many freckles they have, and whether any of them were uh, you know, descended from Dutch people, and uh, whether they, how recently they cut their toenails, and so forth. You have to have sort of a whole, full, detailed account. If you leave any of that information out, says Friedman, then your, your model is becoming unrealistic, because you're abstracting away from the accurate details. And say you're, you know, you're creating a stylized farmer. In economic models, the farmers, you know, there's no fact of the matter as to what color overalls they're wearing, or whether they're wearing overalls, or whether they're wearing anything, or whether they're male or female, or tall or short. You abstract away from that. You have these idealized, sort of purely abstract farmers. But of course, no real farmers in the real world are purely abstract. They all have some definite height and some definite number of freckles and so on. And so, of course, said Friedman, these economic models are going to be unrealistic um, because they have to be abstract. Because a model that was completely realistic would simply have to describe everything. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, complaining about a map because a map, uh, you know, is not an exact duplicate of the territory. Or an exact duplicate of the territory would have to be as large as the territory, and then you wouldn't need the map. You just look at the territory. Uh, you know, if you had a map that showed every single detail, you know, every single detail that you'd see if you actually went, the map would have to be as large as, you know, the territory. Anyway, so Friedman says, look, what we care about in a model is its predictive power. A model can't be realistic. Therefore, we shouldn't care about realism. We shouldn't care about how accurately the model describes reality. We should care about predictive power. So even if a model is wildly unrealistic, as long as the model successfully predicts, you know, what more do you need? Well, Austrians have several replies to this. Um, I'm going to focus on sort of you know, one particular reply about the nature of abstraction. But I want to mention a couple of others as well. Uh, for one thing, um, the mere fact that a model is successful at predicting doesn't, you know, doesn't make it all that great if you don't understand why it's successful at predicting. Because if you don't understand why it's successful, then you're not going to have a good idea as to how long it's likely to remain successful. Take the following example. Suppose that just before the first Lord of the Rings movie came out, I had formed a following hypothesis. I, uh, there's a model according to which there is a constant Tolkienian force in the universe that produces a Tolkien film once each year. That's my hypothesis. That's my model. Someone says, that's, that's not realistic. There aren't constant Tolkienian forces. I say, yes, yes, I know that. You... You poor benighted soul, you haven't read Friedman. You don't know that the hypothesis doesn't have to be realistic, it just has to be good at predicting. So I try it, and you know, Fellowship of the Ring comes out, say, okay, well, confirmed once. The next year, Two Towers comes out, and so now you get another confirmation. Next year, Return of the King comes out, yet another confirmation. I wait expectantly the year after that, nothing. Um, my model was a really good predictor for a while, and then it failed. Um, now, if you actually understand, if you had a model that actually explained the production of these films in the terms of the actual things that caused them, then you wouldn't be surprised. You know, you'd know that they're filming a trilogy and that they were coming up with one each year, and after they were done, they're going to stop. Well, likewise, then, you've got to have economic models. There can be various reasons that certain trends will go on for a while and then change. But if your model isn't talking about the reasons that things happen, but simply is, is solely relying on predictions without caring at all about explanation, then the model isn't going to have any particular, isn't going to give you any reason to predict that the, you know, the regularity is going to be a long-term regularity or a short-term regularity. You know, after all, for, uh, you know, when I was young, I had a good inductive reason to believe that every year I experienced would be a year in the 20th century, because that was a very well-confirmed hypothesis for me for a long time. And then, 
uh, you know, then things went wrong, and I haven't experienced another year in the 20th century, you know, for quite a while, though, you know, maybe next year. Um, so, uh, anyway, so that's one criticism. Uh, another criticism is that even if, um, you know, even if you think that models don't have to be perfectly realistic, you might think they should at least include the, you know, you know think that some information is more included, important to include than others. So, for example, how many freckles a farmer has doesn't actually, you know, tend for the most part to affect the grain market. But things like, you know, asymmetries of information and so forth, those play an important role in explaining things. And, you know, so this is sort of related to, you know, the other worry Austrians have about, both about Friedman and Keynes, namely this tendency to over-aggregate and, uh, you, know, you know, abstract away from precisely the things that Austrians want to appeal to as being explanatory. But leaving those aside, let's just think about this notion of abstraction. The idea that the alternative to having an unrealistic model is to have a model that doesn't leave any information out. Is that right? Well, I don't think so. And Mises didn't think so. In fact, there's a long philosophical tradition of not thinking so. And uh, uh, here's a way of thinking about it. Suppose that uh, I could have told you that I own a Cocker Spaniel, but instead I decided to just tell you that I own a dog. Is the second claim less realistic than the first? Is it less accurate? Uh, no, it gives you less information, but it seems it's equally true. Or actually, in this case, equally false, because I don't currently own any dog. But uh, I did once own a Cocker Spaniel, and I could have told you that, and I could tell you that I once owned a dog. And they'd both be equally true. Uh, and I didn't mention what breed of dog it is. But the difference between not mentioning what breed of dog it is and, you know, claiming, suppose I had claimed that I once owned a dog that was of no particular breed. Uh, it was of no particular size or color. It was just a truly generic dog. Well, you know, you might be skeptical. Uh, you might think my claim is unrealistic. But if you know, I, you know, if I actually say my dog has no particular breed, you know, I don't, and by that I don't mean that it's a mutt. I mean, you know, that, you know there's no, you know, it had no particular color. Did, you know, it had no, well, it, its ears were neither pointy nor floppy. Uh, its coat was neither long nor short, neither curly nor straight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, you wouldn't take that very seriously. But if if all I'm doing is simply telling you I had a dog and leaving that information out, what I'm saying isn't unrealistic. And what I'm saying might or might not be helpful to you, depending on whether the information I'm leaving out, leaving out was important for you or not, which would depend on the circumstances. But essentially, it's not. I'm not saying anything false. Whereas, if instead I, you know, presented my dog as, you know, being sort of a more stylized, abstract version of a dog that really exists, then then they would say something false. So there's a difference between specifying that something doesn't have certain qualities and simply failing to specify that it has them. Now, uh, you know, Mises had a couple of, uh, of quarrels uh, with you know, people he thought highly of. One was Max Weber, and the other was his own teacher, Eugen von Uh His He um, had a quarrel with Max Weber about ideal types. Uh, you know, or in particular about whether the, the abstract concepts that Mises was making use of were ideal types. Uh, so, uh, you know, a Weberian analysis might have something like a stylized conception of the capitalist or the entrepreneur or the worker or the investor or something like that. And would take sort of typical features of them. So take features that are sort of typical of capitalists and you create some image called the capitalist. And a lot of people had thought that um, that Mises was doing something like that. Uh, you know, and you know, we do, we, the, these ideal types were, as Weber put it, one-sided exaggerations or one-sided intensifications. Think of a caricature. When you make a caricature of someone, what you do is you take the most distinctive features, the features that make them most differ from the average person, and you exaggerate them. So if someone has slightly larger ears than the average person, then you make the ears even bigger. 
Uh, if someone is slightly shorter than the average person, you make them even shorter and so forth. That's how you do caricatures. Um, or, you know, and lots of imitations in general, is you take the features by which they deviate from the norm and you exaggerate them. Uh, so you know, Weber, in effect, was saying this is what you do in creating these ideal types. You treat a capitalist as if they're solely a capitalist. Um, and uh, Mises said, well, you know, there may be purposes for which you might want to do that for some reason or other, but that's not what praxeology is doing. Praxeology is not interested in uh, you know, abstract, stylized versions of people that bear you know, some vague relationship to reality. Praxeology is trying to explain uh, actual transactions, transactions between actual people in the actual world. Now, he had a similar quarrel with Bumba Verk. Uh, when uh, Mises was working on the theory that would become his theory of money and credit, uh, and he was very interested in uh, you know, what we tend nowadays to call Cantillon effects. I don't think he actually used that phrase in the book, to my knowledge. But Cantillon effects are when, the, as I was mentioning earlier, it's one of these time and ignorance things, the injection of new money into the economy, you know, if, everyone get, if, everyone's money, if everyone's amount of money doubles overnight, you know, and everyone knows it, then there's really no problem in terms of inflation because you know, your salary rises a certain amount, your bank balance rises a certain amount, the prices of everything you buy rise the same amount, and you know, no one's any better off or any worse off. Uh, you know, if you, you know, did it all by helicopter. But uh, you know, in real life, uh, you get these differential effects where money gets injected into the economy, and certain people receive it first. And so certain people, their bank balances increase when they're still facing lower prices. Um, and you know, this creates various kinds of dislocations in the economy, uh, creates you know, mistaken incentives to invest in certain things because things look more profitable than they really are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, so uh, Mises was explaining these ideas enthusiastically to his teacher. And to his disappointment, Bum Baverick wasn't that thrilled with it. Bum Baverick liked this idea of, you know, simply uh, you know, that the money supply is, you know, basically neutral. You just increase it and sort of magically increases everywhere. And he says, well, yeah, of course, that's not quite how it works in real life. Because, you know, there's friction, as he called it. Just like you have an idealized physical model where you treat a frictionless sphere rolling down a, a frictionless you know, inclined plane or something, and then you, you analyze its motion. Of course, in real life, nothing perfectly matches that. But then, you know, what, 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 what balls rolling down planes actually do is sort of an approximation to this ideal. And Mengus says things like that, too. Uh, you know, so the things we think of as distinctively Austrian, some of them don't come about at the very beginning. Mises introduces a lot of them. Uh, Menger says things about how economics is trying to analyze the activity of, trying to analyze economic activity. And, uh, you know, lot, and, and lots of activity is mostly economic. There's some activity that's non-economic, like giving to charity and, uh, or something like that. And Menger at least sometimes talks as though uh, you know, just economics has nothing to say about that. Instead, we come up with an ideal construct of the businessman as someone who's just concerned in maximizing monetary profit. Of course, no one's like that. But businessmen, when they're doing their business, are kind of sort of like that. You know, in our ordinary lives, interacting with our friends, we're not very much like that. And so economics doesn't have much to say about that. But when, when, we're, interact, you know, when we're dealing in the business world, we're a lot like that a lot of the time, and so it's, it's a good approximation. Just as you can have rules about, you know, laws about gold or generalizations about gold, even though there aren't any pure samples of gold. But lots of samples of gold are mostly pure. So Mises doesn't like those aspects that you can find in Menger and in, uh, uh, and in Bumba Berg. And in some earlier people who are, you know, who are also important to the Austrians. I mean, you can see Bastiat doing this kind of thing that Mises doesn't like either. And uh, you know, Mises didn't like Bumbayavak's suggestion that the you know this older monetary theory that doesn't take into account Cantillon effects was somehow true in principle or true for purely economic activity, and that somehow there were these non-economic factors that that screwed it up. That wasn't the way Mises' way saw it at all. Well, how is Mises thinking about abstraction? Well, I think Mises is thinking about abstraction in a way that really runs back to Aristotle's dispute with Plato. 
uh, or at least a one way of interpreting Aristotle's dispute with Plato. Aristotle is interested in the question of whether abstractions apply to the real world. Uh, you know, Plato had suggested that abstractions don't apply perfectly to the real world. That uh, you know nothing is perfectly you know, and absolutely uh, a table. Uh, nothing completely measures up strictly to tableness because everything is sort of a little non-tabley in some respect. Um, and in particular, you know, you might not find that that, that plausible for tables. But let's say for mathematical things, you know, like for triangle, nothing is perfectly triangular in the physical world. Uh, no lines, are, no, no border is perfectly straight. If you look at this close enough, it's all kinds of bumps. Uh, so geometry and geometrical objects don't have weight and don't have color and so forth. So, you know, you might think geometry is about some other world besides the physical world. So Plato thought, yeah, there is another world besides the physical world, and geometry is mainly about that, although it turns out it has some imperfect application to our world. There were other people who said, who didn't believe in Plato's realm of forms, and they just concluded, well, geometry really isn't, isn't about anything real. So geometry, you know, they agreed geometry isn't about the physical world. Either it's about some non-physical world, or it is just about nothing. Uh, or it's about ideas in our head or something. Aristotle disagreed. Aristotle thought that geometry and mathematics are about the physical objects in our world. And that uh, abstractions in general apply to real, ordinary things. It's just that they abstract from certain features. Uh, you know, just as I could tell you that something is a dog without telling you what breed it is, so I can tell you that something is a, you know, it has a certain shape without going into all the details of you know, exactly what color it is or what it weighs or where it has bumps on it that deviate from that shape and so forth. I can talk about, you can talk about things like location and extension and abstraction from lots of the details. Uh, and uh, so rather than, than geometry, say, being about some realm of things that don't have these properties, he says that geometry studies the same things that physics does, but doesn't study them as physical. Well, then that distinction gets, gets picked up and developed by Aristotelian thinkers in the Middle Ages. And you find people like, um, uh, like uh, Abelard and Aquinas uh, making a distinction between two kinds of abstraction. And I'm sorry, David, but I have, to I have to talk about these two kinds of abstraction. Um, so, uh, and I have them... Uh, I have these terms on the handout, precisive and non-precisive abstraction. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this, is terminology that, uh, this is often the terminology that is used to talk about this distinction. Uh, so precisive abstraction is abstraction where you actually specify that certain properties are absent. Uh, so, for example, I said that my dog, if I were to claim that my dog was of no particular breed, I'd be trying to, you know, trying to sell you a non-precise, I'd be trying to sell you a precisive abstraction. A non-precisive abstraction is when you just think about, about dog without thinking about any particular uh, kind of dog. Now, for any of you who are familiar with Ayn Rand's epistemology, uh, her idea of measurement omission is basically the same idea. Um, that... Uh, when I think about tables or dogs without thinking about what color they are, it's not that I'm thinking of them as having no color. I'm assuming, sure, they have some color or other, or other but I just don't specify what it is. You, you, know, you don't specify that these features are absent. You simply spe fail to specify that they're present. And uh, here's a quote from Thomas Aquinas um, that uh, will help to... Uh, explain this idea. So, abstraction may occur in two ways, says Aquinas. First, we may understand that one thing does not exist in some other, or that it is separate from it. That's an example of precisive. Um, so, for example, if I were to claim, you know, if I were to tell you about some economy where uh, ignorance is actually absent, you know, no one is ignorant, that would be a precisive abstraction. I would be saying, you know, I'd be simply specifying that there's no ignorance. Secondly, we understand one thing without considering another. That is, I can simply tell you about the economy, I just don't mention whether there's ignorance or not. I just you know, don't include that in my description. Thus, for the intellect to abstract one from another, things which are not really abstract from one another, 
uh, does in the first mode of abstraction imply falsehood. In other words, if my dog really does have some definite breed, or if there really is ignorance in the economy, and I'm you know, trying to get you to think of this dog as not having a breed, or trying to think of you, of you, get, get you to think of the economy as not having ignorance in it, then I'm trying to get you to think something false. But if instead, well, go to go on, uh, but in the second mode of abstraction, that is the non-precisive, for the intellect to abstract things which are not really abstract from one another does not involve falsehood. In other words, if I was telling you that the, uh, about an economy that has no ignorance in it, I'd be telling you to imagine something false. But if I simply tell you, uh, you about the economy and I don't just say anything one way or the other about ignorance, I'm just not mentioning it, I'm omitting any consideration of that one way or the other, then whether or not my economic model is useful, I'm not, it's not false. And likewise, if I don't say anything about how many freckles the farmers have, I'm not saying anything false. If I say, you know, these farmers have no freckles when they do, then I'd be saying something false. But if I simply fail to mention it, then I'm not. Uh, if, therefore, the intellect is said to be false when it understands a thing otherwise than as it is, that is so if the word otherwise refers to the thing understood. So here's what he means. Someone might say, look, you know, here, what is falsehood? To think of something falsely is to think of it as you know, otherwise than as it is. But you know, if I think of the economy and I'm not thinking about all the freckles on the, on the farmers, then am I not thinking of the farmers otherwise than as they are? Because they, there they are with their freckles, and I'm thinking of them without thinking of any freckles. Uh, you know, so you know, there are the freckled farmers out there, and the, and the freckleless farmers in my head, isn't that, doesn't that make it false? And what Aquinas is saying is, well, this phrase, uh, thinking about them otherwise than as they are, is ambiguous. If you think of something that is actually freckled, and you think of it as not freckled, then you're thinking of it as something false. But if, you, but if you think about something that's freckled and you simply fail to think of it as freckled, it's not that you think of it as not freckled, it's just that you don't, you know, you don't take anything, any, anything on the box one or the other as to you know, freckles, you don't say anything about it, then it's not false. So the way Aquinas puts it is, uh, you know, the intellect is false if, if otherwise it refers to the thing understood. Hence the intellect would be false if it abstracted the species of a stone from its matter. The species means the form, um, you know, the, the, the structure, the essence of a stone. If you think of that as, as someone existing apart from the matter, then Aquinas, not being a Platonist, says, you'd be thinking of something false. Stone essences don't float off by themselves apart from actual stones. Um, uh, however, you can think about the stone essence without thinking of the physical components it's embodied in. So not so, if otherwise it's taken as referring to the one who understands. So, by thinking of something, uh, if by otherwise you mean thinking of something that's different from the thing you're actually trying to think of, then you've got falsehood. If instead you're simply, you're talking about what you're considering, then it's not. Uh, so, it's not the case that, that every abstract description is therefore an unrealistic description. You know, if your map, you know, if your map doesn't include every little detail, it doesn't show every little tree and so forth, that doesn't mean your map is inaccurate. Um, now, if it said, you know, treeless expanse here, it wrote there, uh, that would be wrong. But when something, when the map leaves something out, it's not telling you that there's nothing there. Because after all, you know what a map is for. It's, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't take that as, you know, you wouldn't take the absence of a feature on a map as a guarantee that it's not there. Because you know the maps are trying to talk about certain things and not others. Um, now, if there are two roads of equal size and importance, and it includes one and doesn't include the other, and it's supposed to be sort of a useful roadmap for the whole area, well, then there'd be falsehood because there's sort of an implication. What maps are trying to do is tell you about, you know, all roads of a certain degree of importance. I mean, I'd have a little alley behind your house, but it'll have the things that are important for whatever your purpose is. So what counts as falsehood will depend on some extent on the understanding of what the purpose of the thing is supposed to be. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, if I um, uh, if I'm investigating a crime and I go in and I say you know, there was a dead well, and you say what did you find in the room and I say well, there was a dead body in the room and I come out I didn't mention that there's also a live person standing above the dead body holding a knife you know in a context where you expect to get certain information you expect the information is going to be relevant 
then you might think that my describing it in a way that leaves out the information, you know, given the context, could be deception. But, uh, you know, again, it depends on your purposes. So, you know, Mises' point that he was trying to make to Bambaverk and also to Weber, when he said to Weber, look, praxeological concepts aren't ideal types. They're not one-sided intensifications. Basically, what he meant was, ideal types are precise at abstractions. You take something like the capitalist, and you have some kind of idealized, stylized model of a capitalist that doesn't perfectly fit any capitalist in the real world. you are just using it for some purpose or other. And Mises isn't necessarily against using those such things for various purposes. He's saying, that's not what we're doing in praxeology. In praxeology, we're coming up with non-precise precise of abstractions, abstractions that apply with complete, with complete and total truth to everything that they're about. Now, does this mean that there's no room for uh, precisive abstractions, that is, these stylized, falsifying abstractions in Austrian economics? No, it doesn't mean that. There are purposes for which you use them. Uh, take Mises' example of the evenly rotating economy. This is, a, uh, this is an economy that uh, is completely predictable. Uh, tastes never change. Knowledge never changes. People produce the same stuff over time. And so it's obviously not an accurate description of the real economy. But it's not supposed to be. Uh, Mises isn't, isn't saying, consider the evenly rotating economy and use it to draw predictions about what the actual economy is going to look like. If you did that, you would come to grief because the predictions that you'd get from the evenly rotating economy are dramatically different from those you'd get from the actual economy, and that's the point. The purpose of the evenly rotating economy is not to serve as a model of the actual economy. The purpose of the evenly rotating economy is to help us grasp certain distinctions, like, for example, the distinction between profit and interest. You could easily get glopped together. You know, you, uh, you, know, you, invest, you invest some money certain amount of money, you get some larger amount of money back. How much of that is profit? How much of that is interest? What's the difference? Well, it's, you know, it's not obvious. Part of the point of having the concept of an evenly working economy is to see the difference. Um, because then you can see why there wouldn't be any profit in an evenly working economy. Because you know, there are no profit opportunities. Because everyone knows what's being produced. It's always the same amount. Never knows what everyone wants are. No one's wants ever change. And... Uh, you know, never any, nothing's ever an undersupply or oversupply. So there's not really any any ability to make a profit. You know, everyone's getting what they want. They can't really introduce anything new. But there would still be interest because, you know, whatever it is you're getting periodically, you still want to get it earlier rather than later, and so you're still willing to pay more uh, to get it earlier than to get it later. And so people are still going to have to pay you in order to get you to delay your consumption. Um, so the evenly rotating economy has a function. You know, so it's not as though Austrian economists are somehow forbidden to use unrealistic examples. But the purpose of the unrealistic example isn't to treat it as some sort of picture of what the economy is really like. It's to help us, uh, it's to help us grasp profit and interest in real-world cases where they do seem all mixed together. You know, the real world has both profit and interest in it. And so the purpose of this world that has only only interest and no profit, isn't to, um, isn't to model the real world, is to help us recognize something in the real world. So in that sense, an uh, unrealistic model can be used in order to help us grasp some very simple version of something so we then use it for a realistic model. Another example would be, uh, you know, think of... Uh, of Rothbard's use and many other economists' use of the Robbins Crusoe model, where you want to explain things like capital goods, and your first explanation of them is some guy alone on his island, you know, trying to take time away from catching fish to make nets. And I think, well, all right, maybe that's a realistic description of some guy on an island. That's not a realistic description of the actual economy. Well, sure, it's not supposed to be. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be unreal. It's you know. The purpose of that is not to use Robinson Crusoe to help us predict what the market for nets is going to look like in the real world. It's to help us grasp a certain distinction, which we can then use uh, later. Um, so there's this, you know, there's this line of thinking about this distinction abstraction that runs back to Aristotle. It runs through the medieval Aristotelians, you know, both the realists and the nominalists. That's the people who thought universals existed in their own right, and the people who thought they were just 
you know, ideas in our minds or in language. Um, although to some extent, I think that this difference is exaggerated for the medieval philosophers. It was, it was, it was a partly verbal disagreement. But anyway, um, nevertheless, they all accepted something like this distinction. And then uh, you can find the distinction in people who influenced Mises. Uh, people like uh, Brentano and Husserl use the distinction. I don't know if Mises got it from them or just came up with it independently. But when he talks about the way in which praxeological concepts are not these Weberian one-sided intensifications, I do think that uh, he is making the same distinction. Okay, now I promised you to uh, to give you an argument to, for the claim that Friedman's mistake about this, his confusion about realism, as confusion about a priorism are somehow related. Uh, how so? Well, uh, I think that uh, Friedman's thinking that if you're, th- you know, if you're thinking with categories that leave out information, then you must be somehow excluding that information or, or regarding it as not there. I think it's confusing, making a dis- confusion between the act of thinking and uh, the content of the thinking. Uh, you know, so, for example, suppose I think of a horse, and I don't, I'm not thinking of a white horse, I'm just thinking of a horse. I, you know, I don't specify it any more than that, because I want to talk about all, all horses, or what the horse, you know, as a species, uh, is like. So I could say the horse is a, you know, a four-footed mammal that's found in the following geographical regions and does this and that, and, you know, I don't specify any particular color for it, because I'm trying to apply this to all horses. Um... It seems that the Friedman is thinking that if I don't, you know, if I don't specify a color for the horse, then I must be thinking of a colorless horse. Or if I don't specify, you know, the freckles on the grain traders, then I must be thinking of freckleless farmers, oh, and radically freckleless. I mean, it's not like they have zero freckles either, because that's a certain number of freckles. There's no number of freckles they have, not even zero. Um, I think that he's confusing the act of thinking with the content. Uh, and this sort of fits together with what um, uh, with what Aquinas says. He talks about the two senses of thinking of something otherwise than as it is, otherwise applying to the thing understood, treating that thing as otherwise than it is, or applying to the understanding, thinking you know thinking of the you know, my thinking of it being other than it is, but not you know the content of what I'm thinking. You know, so when I think of the grain market and I, and I don't think about how many freckles the farmers have then my act of thinking is, uh, is leaving out the freckles. But what I'm thinking about, namely the farmers, I'm not, I'm not you know, the fr- it's not that freckles are absent from the farmers, it's that freckles are absent from uh, my thinking about them. Uh, I'm not thinking about you know, some freckleless farmers up in platonic heaven, I'm thinking of the actual freckled, possibly zero freckled, but that's, you know, limiting case of freckled. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of the actual freckled farmers in the real world, but I'm just, I'm thinking of them in a non-freckle relevant way, but I'm not thinking of non-freckled uh, farmers. So, if Friedman's making the mistake of thinking that, uh, that, um, you know, Thinking of you know, not thinking about the freckles is equivalent to thinking of non-freckled farmers. I think he's confusing the act of thinking with the content. But I think that is you know, that's a confusion of the logical with the psychological. Uh, at least it seems to me it's something in the same ballpark, and that's the same distinction I think he was missing uh, when he um, uh, when he was taking self-evidence to be a matter of, sort of listening to uh, an inner voice. So um, uh, I think that's what's something called psychologism, which is this tendency to to treat logical relations and conceptual relations as if they're somehow psychological. Uh, I think that may be what dri- what's driving Mises here. I mean, not Mises, Friedman here. Uh, I think it goes together with empiricism, because empiricism has this tendency to think, well, you've got empirically verifiable stuff over here, verifiable or falsifiable, whatever your bull is, and then you've got everything else over here and sort of glopping it all together as sort of the vague, fuzzy, non-empirical stuff. Now, no empiricist does this consistently because they all like math. But there's just this tendency 
to think that anything that isn't empirically testable is some sort of you know, odd glop that they don't spend that much time thinking about. And so I think that's why, he, you know, for the same reason that he tends to run together uh, um, you know, grasping a public logical concept versus listening to some private inner deliverance of something, I think that's also why he tends to confuse the act and content of thinking, and thus thinks that uh, you know, every abstract model has to somehow be unrealistic or has to falsify the real world, which he then wants to make a virtue of and saying, all right, well, then we won't try to describe the world because we can't, we'll just try to predict it. As though predictions themselves weren't going to be in some degree abstract um, as well. Um, now, finally, just one thought. Uh, although you know, Mises is, you know, is free of this error when he's talking about economics, uh, I think that when, when Mises talks about ethics and why ethics can't be objective, it seems to me he might follow, fall into this as well, because when he starts considering the possibility of a priori ethics, Mises says, well, that's basically listening to an inner voice, and there's no way you can test you know, listening to an inner voice. So I think that Mises is reacting to, you know, to people who believe in an objective ethics in something like the way that Friedman is reacting to Mises. And so that's a suggestion that, well, maybe Mises shouldn't have done that. Okay, questions? Yes? Um, I'm thinking on my face. No, you're sitting. I just want to try an argument here. Um, I think you to make this distinction between imprecise and precise abstraction, you're going to be forced into uh, a regress, which is going to force you back to the basic abstractions of always being precise in the following way. Uh, using the uh, imprecision for measurement emission, what measurement is emitted? Like a man's case, he has height, he has some height. The height's not specified. Uh, but what is height? Height is either an imprecise, an imprecise or precise abstraction. If it's imprecise, of what's it leaving out, etc. So you're going to be forced back and back and back until you uh, basically come to uh, something which is precise. Okay so, the, okay, so here's the question. Does the distinction between precisive and non-precisive abstraction open itself up to uh, a regress in the following way? That whenever, um, you know, whenever you've got uh, a, uh, a non-precisive abstraction, what's it leaving out? So for example, if I am thinking about human beings but I leave out their height, well, what is it I'm leaving out? Well, it's going to be another abstraction. Um, so if we want to specify what is, you know, what is height leaving out, we keep on going back and back uh, until eventually we come, uh, you know, we'll have to come to a precisive abstraction to end the regress. Is that your suggestion? Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure why it has to end in a precisive abstraction. I'm not sure why it couldn't just end in something that's not abstract. Um, you know, what I leave out is the, um, you know, the full total, total totality of all your particular features. You, know, you as an individual, if I think of human beings and I apply the concept to you, what I'm leaving out is not just abstractions, I'm leaving out, whoops, I'm leaving out you know, the total particularity of you, you know, all your particular individualized features. I'm leaving, uh, those I'm leaving beside. So those aren't either precisive abstractions or non precisive abstractions. Those are, what am I doing differently from everything I did for the last hour? <laughs> I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, Mill's methods. Um, uh, anyway, so that's my that's my if, if you're answer. Back to some sort of concrete, like those particulars which you're leaving out, you're still going to have to have some notion of sameness, aren't you? I mean, you're, you're just, what is it that you push back to? Now, it looks like it's going to be something like an abstract form which explains sameness across all these particulars that they are that they are similar in some way, which varies, but as the sameness isn't it still isn't really explained. <coughs> Okay, so the question is, if we're going back to the particulars, the particulars I'm leaving out have to be the same in some way. And the sameness, you know, is the same, if the sameness isn't a particular, if the sameness is some universal, then you've got a universal. Well, I think it, a couple of things I could say there. One is that, uh, I mean, the stuff I'm leaving out doesn't have to be the same. It's the stuff that I'm keeping that has to be the same. Um, uh, and so what I'm keeping is still going to be a... Um, 
you know, a non-precisive abstraction. Now, there are a couple of different ways to, you know, to handle this question. And this is actually relevant to when I was saying that, you know, that the realists and the nominalists in the Middle Ages didn't disagree as much as it seems like, because the, the realists usually wanted to say, well, yes, universals exist really, but they exist as universal only in the mind, and they exist as particularized in the world. And nominalists like Abelard wanted to say, no, universals exist only in the mind, but they have an, uh, an objective basis, and objective relationships in the world, so you know, each side has to grant something right about the other one. One way of handling this is to suggest that the relationships among, of similarity among particulars are themselves particulars. There's a similarity particular here, and a similarity particular there. And those two similarity particulars are, have a similarity particular between them. That can get a little bit baroque, and you might not, you know, might not want that, but that's one way some people have suggested. Um, another way to suggest is, well, it doesn't matter if abstractions turn out somehow to be ineliminable, if, uh, it still doesn't seem as though why they necessarily be precisive. If by a precisive abstraction, you mean an abstraction that specifies as absent something that's actually present, so a falsifying abstraction. You know, so you could, you know, the, the regress could end with some abstractions, and they'd be correct, they'd be accurate. They might not be, you know, yeah, so I'm not sure why it would have to be, why the regress would have to end in precisive as opposed to non-precisive abstractions. Yes? Um, so when Mises came up with the concept of the rotating economy, and so he's using a precisive abstraction there, that's what I would say. Yeah. The question is, is the evenly rotating economy a precisive abstraction? I say yes. Okay, so um, then did he have to like reconcile his conclusions using non-precisive abstractions? Or was there, like, you know, like whatever, whatever information he got out of using his like construct, like that wouldn't necessarily tell him about like the real world? All right, so the question is, how, uh, how, by con how is it that by contemplating this precisive abstraction of the evenly rotating economy, how is that going to be relevant to understanding the real world using non-precisive abstractions? Well, here's how, it, how I'm thinking of it. At least one function of the evenly rotating economy is to help us grasp the difference between profit and interest. But, you know, although profit, you know, in this case, you know, in the case of the, in, in the example of the evenly rotating economy, you have interest without profit. Um, you have a world that has interest and no profit. The real world is not like that. But the purpose of the, of the uh, example is to help us grasp the non-precisive abstractions of interest and profit, you know, the non-falsifying abstractions. So it's just that these, the, you know, the, the non-false abstractions can be easier to see if we look at them in, in an, a fictional case. I mean, here's another example, a way that you know, often a way people learn to identify things, uh, everything from, you know, if you want to tell the difference between a male and a female fruit fly under a microscope, and the first time you look, they don't look different in the least. They're just a lot of little squiggling things. Or examples they did when, uh, in um, World War II trying to identify airplanes. You see an airplane in the distance, you want to know whether it's, you know, someone on your side or someone on the other side. And from a distance, to the inexperienced eye, airplanes all kind of look alike. What they did... In these, what they do in these cases is to give them caricatures. They come up, you know, find the ways in which the, you know, the German plane differs from the American one, come up with cartoons that exaggerate those features, or look at the ways that male fem fruit flies and female fruit flies differ and sort of exaggerate them in the cartoon, and then by grasping those, which of course are false abstractions, but grasping them helps you grasp the correct ones. It helps you then recognize the abstraction when you find it in the real world. Okay, time for one more. Yeah. Um, I was going to give a, a good example of non-precisive abstraction if you care. Um, I, in biology, the way that you classify species is exactly like this. So you've got a description of what an animal is, and then, then you've got a description of, uh, say, something with a spine or without a spine. And everything that has a spine is also an animal. And then under that, you have something, you know, things that are mammals or not mammals. So everything that is a mammal also has a spine, also mm -hmm. is an animal, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's sort of the modern equivalent of the, we used to be called a porphyrian tree. The, the point was just the talk about relations of genus and species in biology are like that. You classify, you know, mammals into, let's say, horses, but everything that's a horse is also a mammal. You classify mammals as vertebrates. Everything that's a mammal is also a vertebrate. So it's not like these more specific things are something other than the generic one. Uh, there's more, you know, more specified, more detailed versions of it. And that's something Aristotle spends a lot of time talking about. Okay, you are free in some very limited sense.